In the late 14th century, the Baltic Sea was surrounded by some powerful nations. In the north, Scandinavia had united to form the Kalmar Union. In the east, the Teutonic Order ruled the Baltic States, while in the south, the German Hanseatic League dominated trade. However, in the midst of them were the Victual Brothers, a group of pirates who brought trade in the region to a standstill. These pirates were in fact so powerful that from their base in Gotland, they were able to sometimes occupy or plunder a number of towns, like Malmo, Bergen, Vyborg in modern day Russia, and they even took part in wars over in Frisia. The Victual Brothers emerged in a tumultuous time in Northern Europe. In the 14th century, the Scandinavian powers, which had once dominated the entire region and even Britain, were on the decline. Denmark, for instance, after many failed and expensive wars, took to mortgaging off chunks of their country to German lords. Gerhard III of Holstein took a great deal of territory for himself, including most of Jutland. This was essentially to make sure that the country didn't completely default on their debts, but they still needed more cash. So Valdemar IV, who ruled from 1340, began to sell off territories they took during crusades like Estonia. This was sold to the Teutonic Order for 19,000 marks, and sales like this allowed the Danes to begin to reclaim their territories in the west and also invade Gotland. Meanwhile, in Sweden, Magnus IV had ruled for decades and was in fact also king of Norway. He famously banned thraldom, or the old Viking slavery, ending the centuries-long institution. But he also fought a number of disastrous wars, like his crusade against Novgorod. This, along with the plague, weakened Sweden. So, exiled lords from Sweden reached out to the Germans for help. Albert of Mecklenburg took up the call and moved into Sweden, becoming king in 1364. He forced King Hakon out of power, but he continued to rule over in Norway and married Margaret, the Queen of Denmark. She will be crucial in the story, so keep her name in mind. Now, inside Sweden, and in fact across the entire Baltic, there were a number of Germans, and they of course welcomed a fellow German as their king. These Germans were instrumental in the creation of the city of Stockholm and formed anywhere between one third and one half of the tax paying citizens. Plus, under Albert, there was a German political faction called the Hatter Broder, who in 1389 rounded up a bunch of Swedish party members into a barn and burnt them alive. This was the Kaplinga murders, and this demonstrated the power of the Hanseatic League in the late 14th century, and in fact, German influence at large. Copenhagen at the same time was developing into one of Denmark's only real cities, but it was constantly under threat of German attack. For instance, back in the 1360s, the Hanseatic League united, drove back Valdemar IV and sacked the city. In the resulting peace treaty, the Treaty of Stralsund, they created a near monopoly of trade, as 15% of all trading revenue the Danes made had to be handed over to the League. But, of course, this League wasn't a nation, it was a trading bloc created to defend their trading interests. Otherwise, the Teutonic Order over in the Baltic States was ruled by a German government, as it was a remnant of the Northern Crusades. So the Germans had spread their influence across the region, but in Sweden, Albert began to lose support. As he did so, Margaret invaded, and she, by this point, was now Queen of Norway and Denmark, and she easily swept into the country. Albert was arrested in 1389, but his supporters, primarily German supporters in Stockholm, held out for years. It was during this siege of Stockholm that the Victual Brothers came into their own. The name Victual Brothers is derived from the Latin word meaning provisions and it refers to their initial job of bringing in supplies to the city. They were organised like a guild and had support from many of the Hanseatic League members, as they feared Danish control of the seas. So they had safe harbours in places like Rostock and Wismar, but soon they became powerful in their own right and turned to piracy and raiding. For instance, in 1393 they sacked Bergen. Outside of Bergen, herring fisheries were abandoned, as the incredibly fast ships of the pirates would just pounce on their own ships. So, as this was the major trading port in Norway, this essentially crippled the Norwegian economy. At the head of the pirates were men like Godfried Mikkelsen, Magister Vigbold, and Stortebeke. Very little is really known about the lives of these men, where they came from, or even their real names. Take Klaus Stortebeke. He was apparently a ruined nobleman, and his name was just a nickname, meaning beaker at a gulp. He got this name because he could drink litres of beer in one go. But, this is probably just a legend. The next year, these pirates attacked Malmo, and then they moved on towns as far away as Turku in Finland and Frisia in the Low Countries. 
So in just a short space of time they became incredibly powerful and their ranks were obviously bolstered by a number of merchants and sailors looking for a quick way to make money. The pirates however were going by the name of Lika dealers, which also means equal sharers. Their greatest success came in 1394 when they captured Gotland. This had only been captured by the Danes in the 1360s and during the Danish invasion they committed a massacre of 1,500 local Gotlanders. So these pirates had a degree of support from the locals and for a little while this base allowed the pirates to dominate trade in the Baltic, along with of course support from the Hanseatic League. Meanwhile Margaret was finally successful in capturing Stockholm and the Kalmar Union was proclaimed, uniting all of Scandinavia. This made her a formidable ruler on land but on sea she could do little to stop the pirates. So in 1394 she got help from Richard II of England but this expedition was a disaster. She then turned elsewhere to the Teutonic Order. Conrad von Juningen was given Gotland as a vassal in return for him crushing the pirate base. He amassed a huge Teutonic fleet of 84 vessels and shipped 5,000 men over to the island in 1398. He successfully captured it and many of the pirates were forced to flee to Finland, northern Germany and Frisia, but they continued to rule the sea for a while. However, over time the Hanseatic states even turned against them and the pirates only had around 500 men by the turn of the century. They managed to find a new patron in Stettin, but Conrad of the Teutonic Order just sent a fleet to blockade the city and the pirates were on their own. The same thing happened across their bases in the Baltic, so they withdrew from the area to the North Sea, where they had support in Frisia and a small base in Heligoland. Stortebeker on his flagship named the Sea Tiger then met his match in 1401. The Hansa led by Simon of Utrecht captured him and in Hamburg he was executed. Of course piracy didn't end there as many could return to Frisia albeit in a weakened state. Frisia at that time was pretty unique as they had since the time of the Vikings enjoyed what was called Frisian freedom. This meant that they didn't have feudal leaders like the rest of Europe. This whole thing probably deserves a video of its own, but this period in Frisian history has been praised by many anarchists. For instance, Peter Gelderloo said, Neighbourhood councils, by organising cooperative work bands or dividing duties between communities, built and maintained the dikes, canals, sluices and drainage systems necessary to protect the entire society. It was a joint approach from the bottom up, from local communities that found their protection through organising themselves in such a way. This means no noble class developed and many other Europeans saw them as sort of going against the will of God in a way. So the Hollanders and various states in the Holy Roman Empire would try to assert their control over the region. But within Frisia, there were families that rose to power, but they were initially seen as firsts among equals. These families were therefore said to have ruled over chieftains, well that's what they were called but really their society is quite hard to describe. Stortebeke by the way had a stronghold in East Frisia in the late 14th century and even married the daughter of a chieftain, Kenoten Broke. Apparently she would join him on expeditions and the group became more ruthless when she was around. But you can see why it would be an appealing place for the pirates to live in. Plus around the same time that the Victual brothers arrived in the region, the Great Frisian War had erupted. This was between powerful families that had split into two parties, the Vetkopas and the Skiringas, both of which weirdly claimed to fight for the preservation of Frisian freedom. The Skiringas sought help from the Holy Roman Emperor, but very little help was forthcoming. So they turned to the Victual brothers. They joined in and from the town of Dokum, they once again brought trade to a standstill in the 1410s. But on land they were losing and the Vetkopas sacked the city and the pirates were forced to find new strongholds. They continue to pop up over the next couple decades in the history books. For instance Bergen, which was already assaulted back in 1393, was again attacked in 1428, 1429 and 1432. The attack in 1429 was particularly deadly. The pirates attacked with 400 men in a couple dozen ships and they not only just plundered the city but they began burning down large sections of it, once again crippling the Norwegian economy. We also know that there were pirate raids across the English Channel as Henry VI complained to the Hollanders about rovers of the sea. Plus John Paston from Norfolk wrote a number of letters around that time referring to pirate raids. But slowly the Hanseatic League, Hollanders, English and Scandinavians were able to bring trade back to the Baltic, as the Victual brothers were chased from place to place and the pirates seemed to have just disappeared somewhere around 1440. 
This of course is just one of what I believe to be many of the forgotten pirate hotspots. Often people talk about the Caribbean, but there were a number of other places that the pirates seemed to love. For instance, there were the Japanese Woku who used to terrorize the Chinese coast, and Madagascar was particularly popular among pirates back in the age of exploration, and there were reports that the pirates even created their own republic or utopia on the island. But do you know of any other sort of forgotten pirate hotspots, let's call them? Leave them in the comments below.